For the last 30 or so years, at the commencement of the new year, we have hosted a service entitled Looking Back, Looking Forward, which has been essentially an open mic service for our church family to share stories of God's faithfulness during the previous year and of their hopes and aspirations for the coming year with God at the centre. This has always been a time of great inspiration and encouragement to the church family. But at the close of looking back, looking forward service, one of the pastors has always brought a short reflection rather than a full blown sermon. And that short reflection is what I'd like to share with you now. I've entitled it, What's in a Name? In the Hebrew scriptures, there's a wonderful story of a people group being freed from slavery and oppression. It's, it's a story full of miraculous intervention. Israel, a fledgling nation led by a man named Moses, had escaped the clutches of Egypt and were headed towards the land that God had promised them many centuries before. They'd encountered great hardship in the hands of the Egyptians and now they were suffering from the harsh elements of the desert life. At which point we are told, then they came to Elim, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped near the water. I'm often, often quite tickled at people's attempt to pronounce this simple four-letter word, Elim, a name which has become very dear to many of us. Some have called Elim, Elim, which in fairness is a decent attempt. Phonetically, I suppose that works. Others have spoken of the Helium Church, which, to be honest, is not such a good attempt. They must think that we are full of hot air or something. No comments on that one, please. I'm often asked about the name of our church and where it comes from. Well, now you know. Elim was an oasis in the desert. It was a place that became a refuge, a resting place, a place of restoration and renewal and retreat. The nation of Israel was in transit, no place to call their own, sweaty, fatigued, confused, frazzled, fearful. Then they came to Elim, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. What's in a name? Well, sometimes a name is meaningful and sometimes meaningless. Over the years I've met ladies whose names were Grace and Faith and Joy. And the majority most certainly lived up to their names. But I've met others who were anything but those names. Church names also fascinate me. Some years ago, I'm not sure if it still exists, there was a church in Camden in London named the Church of the Glorious Undead. How's about that for a, an amazing name? A church aimed, I believe, at uh, goths and punks. In the 1980s and 90s, many churches appeared not to want to call themselves church and change their names to Christian Fellowship, which I think was meant to convey something uh, about the kind of churches that they were. Often a church that focused on community and people rather than buildings and programs. Uh, at least that was essentially the idea at the time. In South Wales, I've become aware of a number of churches that are named Sardis, now, I'm not sure if this is a Welsh phenomenon or if there are churches throughout the rest of the UK named Sardis. Well, Sardis is a biblical name for a church. It's one of the seven churches in Revelation. The downside is that Sardis was a church that had a reputation for being alive, but was dead. And that's what we're told in Revelation chapter 3. Who on earth? would wish to call their church after a church that had a reputation for being alive, yet was dead. And that, by the way, was the judgment of the risen Jesus. Interesting. Then they came to Elim, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. Elim was an oasis, and of course it's possible to be named after an oasis, but in truth be dried up spiritually, offering nothing for the person who needs spiritual refreshment. Of course it's possible to have a name, a reputation even, of being alive, but are spiritually dead and decaying. 
And that perhaps is a great challenge to us in 2023, for us to be our name, and not to break the Trades Description Act, not to be an imposter, but actually to be a place of retreat, a refuge, a haven, a sanctuary, an escape for those who are thirsty and dry, a place, if you like, where heaven meets earth. And indeed, that is what we have sought to be over the years. Even the name of our church's local charity has significance, the Manor House. That's another one that so many people get wrong when they write to us. They write to us at the Manor, spelled M-A-N-O-R, as in Lord of the Manor, instead of M-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, as in Manor from Heaven. Such an easy mistake to make, I suppose. In that story of when the nation were on their way to the Promised Land, they were given daily provision of some food. It was food that they couldn't quite describe. Manna is a Hebrew word which means, what is it? <laughs> Julia sometimes said that about my cooking. What is it? Well, the manna from heaven was God's daily provision, supernatural provision. Some 27 years ago, we believed that what we called the manor house center was as much God's provision to us as the daily provision of manna was for the nation of Israel. It was and is God's provision and through this resource we seek to be God's provision to others in our community physically, emotionally and spiritually. We're not perfect, we don't pretend to be, we get things wrong but the one thing that continues to thrill me that as a church family our overwhelming desire is to serve the purposes of Christ and his kingdom through serving others with the belief that the greatest we can become in the kingdom of God is a servant. In his kingdom, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. For we follow the one who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He is the one who left the splendor of heaven and the privileges of deity to serve the purposes of God. And we are called to have that same attitude as Christ. Well, most of you know by now that this year is the 100th anniversary of Tamworth Elim Church. 100 years since the church was started through the tent meetings held in our town centre by George Jeffrey, the founder of the Elim Pentecostal movement of churches. 100 years of serving our town, 100 years of declaring the Lordship of Jesus, 100 years of reaching out to the least, the lost and the lonely, 100 years of seeing people and families transformed. It has been my privilege to be the 25th pastor of Tamworth Elim Church and the longest serving by a long way. And it's been an immense privilege to be a part of the lives of so many people. One of our church elders was dedicated by me as a baby, then baptised by me as a teenager, then married by me and now serves as a church leader alongside me. Okay, I, I know what you're thinking. I'm old. I get it. 30 years is a long time, but I'm also conscious of the 70 years before I turned up in Tamworth. I am aware and thankful for the faithful witness of this church in the 70 years before I arrived. And I'm so aware of how battens have been passed down from generation to generation, not just from pastor to pastor, but the many who have chosen to serve the purposes of God in their own generation. Of the 24 pastors who came before me, I've only ever known or met three of them. And yet the other 21 whose names I do not know have their names written in heaven and probably in some file in headquarters as well. By the way, those two places are not the same place. They served faithfully in their day. There's a verse in Acts chapter 13 which states that David served the purpose of God in his own generation. Sorry about stating the obvious here. But that was the only generation in which he could have served God. Bit of a no-brainer, really. He couldn't have served God any other time, any other generation. That was his time. And this is our time. 
It's our time when we pass batons on and when we receive batons from others who have run the race faithfully before us. Please, please, please do not take a back seat. Don't just allow others to do all the work when you spectate from the grandstands. Let it be said that you, whatever your name is, fill in your name there, has served the purposes of God in his or her generation. This is your time. If you're still breathing and God hasn't taken you yet to be with him, then there is yet more for you to do and to serve him. Let me come into land. A few moments ago I mentioned a church in Sardis, a church that had a reputation for being alive yet was dead. There is another church in the same area of Asia Minor in the first century that also had some challenging things said about it. This church had a great reputation for serving God. They were renowned for their hard work, their patient endurance, their concern for truth, their suffering for the message of Christ, and yet the risen Christ had a complaint. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. They got a lot right, but they had forgotten the greatest commandments were to love God and to love others. And that tells me that it is possible to serve Jesus without loving Jesus. Making time to serve but not having time to pray. Having time to prepare a Bible study but not having time to open the scriptures for personal devotion. Loving our ministry but not taking time to show our love to Jesus. Focusing on the work of the kingdom but ignoring the king. One of the biggest errors into which a church can fall is where the congregation is entirely focused on the works of the kingdom in acting justly, loving mercy, but at the same time failing to walk humbly with the king of the kingdom. There was another church mentioned in the book of Revelation that had a dubious reputation. This church had a reputation for being lukewarm. To this church Jesus said, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. I know this verse has often been quoted in terms of Jesus standing and knocking on the door of an individual's heart. And I suppose there's a truth in that. But this scripture wasn't so much directed at an individual, but directed at the church. Imagine that. A church that met for worship and gathered to listen to the Bible being explained and taught. A church that met to serve its community in so many and varied ways, yet it was a church that refused entry to Jesus himself. He was on the outside, knocking at the door, asking to be let in. A cautionary tale indeed. And please God, let that never be said of us at Tamothelium. Let us truly be in a place of refreshment in our community or let us also give to others from the overflow of our hearts let our mouth speak from the inner recesses of our hearts let us serve others out of a relationship with the servant king at the start of 2023 may i suggest four ways that we can look firstly look back and thank god look forward and trust God. Look around and serve God and look up and seek God. Then they came to Elim where there were twelve springs and seventy palm trees and they camped there near the water. Thank you so much for joining us today. May the Lord bless you. Have a great week indeed. God bless.